Welcome to All Home Care Matters, the show where we discuss all things home care with discussions on important age-related matters and topics. Brought to you by Enriched Life Home Care Services, the number one rated home care provider in Michigan by top rated local. Hi everyone, today's video is sponsored by Ada and we wanted to take a moment to talk to you about something important. Now that we are in the winter months, it's time to talk about some common health issues that we encounter like the flu, RSV, allergies, and of course, COVID-19. COVID-19 can affect each of us differently, especially if we have certain conditions that put us at higher risk for severe symptoms. But here's the good news. I have a quick and simple solution for you. Ada has a free health questionnaire that can help you figure out if you are at risk of getting seriously sick from COVID-19 this season. Even better, it can tell you if you're eligible for treatment. Yes, there are treatments available now that can help you avoid getting really sick. The best part, the questionnaire is super easy and completely free. Plus, it can connect you with a clinician in just two hours any day of the week and even on Sundays. So while you are enjoying all the fun stuff that winter brings, take a moment to look after your health. Click on the link below to take the questionnaire and learn more about your risk and treatment options to make sure that you have a healthy and safe winter season. Hello and welcome back to All Home Care Matters. If this is your first time visiting us here at the show, we want to say thank you for taking time out to be with us today. We appreciate how valuable everyone's time is, and that's why we try and make each episode here at All Home Care Matters something that will hopefully matter to you. Today, we are honored to welcome Kim Callanan, the CEO and President of Compassion and Choices, along with Jessica Impeño, the National Director of Clinical Engagement and Education with Compassion and Choices. Welcome. Thanks so much for having us. Our pleasure, our pleasure. I wanna first start with you, Kim, and have you explain a little bit about what Compassion and Choices is? And then I wanna kind of uh, dovetail that with why dementia is a focus of Compassion and Choices. Yeah, thanks, Lance, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Our pleasure. Um, Compassion and Choices is the oldest and largest national nonprofit organization, and our mission is to improve care, expand options, and empower everybody to chart their own end-of-life journey. And what we really are about is um, when people accept the inevitability of their death, it allows them to have a much more meaningful life. And what we look to do is to make sure that as a, a country, that we have the laws, that we have a healthcare system, and that people have the information and the tools that they need to be able to chart their own end of life journey and live that meaningful and fulfilling life. When you look at the issue of dementia, um, there is no question it has become a global pandemic. You have, you know, depending on the data, one in two, one in three seniors that are dying or older people that are dying with or from dementia. And um, it just can't be ignored. Um, there are a lot of challenges with dementia. You can um, get dementia, like with my grandmother, and she lived really a meaningful quality of life for several years. Um, but then she hit a point where it, it, there was, uh, you just, uh, there was no more meaning left in her life for her, the way that, you know, she thought of life. And people are really scared of that. Right. Um, and I think they're confused by it. And so we can't tackle how one lives the final chapter of their life and ignore the growing um, pandemic of dementia. And so that's partly why, that is why the organization places such a priority right. on dementia. How you die is just different than you do with other illnesses. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's talk a little bit more about the magnitude of the issue of dementia, because, you know, you were on one of our other shows, Conscious Caregiving, that Lori and LeBay and I uh, produced together. And, you know, that was on end of life care and compassion and choices is trying to, you know, make sure people's wishes are respected. And, you know, you're trying to make that a better process for families. But the issue of dementia, like you said, it is, it's enormous. It is a pandemic. And it seems like we all know somebody who has been touched by it, if not in our direct families. What is, what is it about the magnitude of the issue of dementia, though? Well, I mean, globally, it's estimated that over 47 million are, people are living with dementia. Um, and in the U.S., it's nearly 7 million Americans. 
um, which is one in seven adults over the age of 70. Um, and the reality is that it's just expected to grow by 2015 um, leaps and bounds. And dementia has become such a crisis, partly because we've gotten really good with medical technologies at, at extending life, but we don't yet know how to extend the brain. And it's put us at this place where we don't have medical care um, that um, keeps the, the brain as active as you can keep the body. And that puts us in a position where we have to start thinking about what end of life looks like with dementia. And it's vastly different. And there are a lot of ethical issues. So, you know, we can't treat it as a one size fits all. Every individual person has different values and beliefs. Religion often comes into play. Um, and our position is that the individual person should be guiding the kinds of decisions they make um, when it comes to dementia um, and documenting them in, in advance. But unfortunately, given how reticent people are to talk about these issues, oftentimes no one's talking about it. And right. it just leaves these devastating decisions for families to make um, that are just so difficult. And that's why we want to take this issue out of the darkness and um, give it some some light and some hope because you can make um, decisions that will be empowering if you give it some forethought. And, and, I, and I think conversations like this or conversations we've had previously, it helps to remove a little bit of that stigma each time where people aren't afraid, aren't embarrassed, aren't ashamed, aren't scared to have these kind of conversations with their doctors, with their family members, because, you know, there will come a time where we want to make sure whatever our desires are, are respected and, you know, um, followed through on, you know, but if it's not written down, if you haven't had these conversations, you're kind of leaving the decisions up in the air with what other people's values may be, but it may not align with yours, right? So that, that kind of helps me, that kind of helps me to segue over to Jessica and, I want to talk about what challenges and problems do you see or are you seeing with the way healthcare is delivered to folks living with dementia? Yeah, there are a lot of, of challenges. You know, dementia is really challenging um, overall, but especially from a clinical perspective, because everyone experiences it differently. It right. is really unpredictable. There's lots of ups and downs and twists and turns, and there really is no effective treatment for dementia. So the focus becomes on managing symptoms, which, you know, could range from anxiety, agitation, and hallucinations to falls, uh, incontinence, or sleep issues. But also, it's a, it's a disease that not everybody understands well. And I'm not just talking about, you know, family caregivers in the community, but healthcare professionals too. It's not treated as the terminal disease that it actually is. We don't talk about what to expect, let alone how to plan and what people want for their care as the disease progresses, because it will progress. So, you know, the other thing that's important is people with dementia are shown to be hospitalized more often and for longer. They use more health care. They're at higher risk for falls and injuries. And so we really need to have those honest conversations about what's going on. Like you were saying, you know, reducing that stigma, talking about what is most important, how to plan for the disease that is going to continue getting worse no matter what we do. And our healthcare system is oriented towards treatment, towards cure, uh, towards extending life, unless they are given instructions otherwise. Right. And I think too, and you ladies might want to speak to this more, but you know, even down to the hospice provider or the physician, they're going to have different ideas and ways of treating, you know, towards end of life or treating somebody living with dementia based on what their opinion is of quality of life. And you know, I tell families all the time with my day job, you know, hospice is not a one size fits all either. Some hospices have this philosophy, others have a different one. Really know it goes back to what your loved ones would want and what their wishes are to know what the right decision is, even for a hospice provider. Yep. Let's talk about treatments though, Jessica, briefly. What are some examples of treatments a person living with dementia is given that they may not want? 
Yeah, this is a great question because there's so many different things that it could be. Um, we could be looking at ongoing medications for other chronic conditions like heart disease or kidney failure, uh, dialysis for kidneys. Um, we could be looking at aggressive treatments for maybe a new diagnosis that has come in in addition to the dementia. So like a new diagnosis of cancer, for example. Um, it's also not uncommon to see things like artificial hydration or nutrition, like, like long-term feeding tubes for people with dementia that have lost that ability to swallow or are no longer eating on their own. But another good example um, is pneumonia. Most people don't realize that the most common cause of death for people with dementia is actually a pneumonia infection, an infection in the lungs. And that presents people with a decision that usually needs to be made, or really it's an opportunity for them to make a choice. So for example, do you want to treat that infection aggressively, even if that means IV antibiotics, the discomfort of having an IV, risking that somebody doesn't like it there and pulls it out? You know, people don't always realize, like you were saying, that they have a choice that it's okay to refuse treatments or to stop treatments if it's not what they want. So, and I think it's important to remember that while we might be able to treat these other conditions and manage other chronic diseases, or even treat the symptoms that we commonly see in dementia, there's no treatment for dementia itself. It's a disease of the brain for which there is no cure. And, you know, like we've been saying, everybody's different. And what you want matters. And it's so important to talk about it so that other people know what you want. Yeah. And and I think, and I'd let you ladies speak to this as well. It's important for people not to be bullied or pressured into saying what their wishes are. It really needs to be truly what their wishes are, not what other people suggest or recommend. They can give you ideas or maybe, you know, talk things out with you. But at the end of the day, you should be the one making the decision solely based on what your feelings are and wishes are. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'll just add to that. What's so hard about dementia is it really does speak to the importance of pre-planning yes. because by the time those decisions are made, you no longer have the mental capacity to be able to make them. So if you haven't stopped and had those conversations well in advance and have a healthcare proxy who really understands what you want, it's too late. Yeah. And that's um, that's why this work is so important um, because you know there's a limited time for everybody to be able to think about it. And it's, you know, it's now is that time, not later. Absolutely. It's never too early, right? Um, yes. Kim, I wanna go to you real quickly. I understand recently you guys completed a na uh, nationwide poll around this very issue. What did what did the poll tell you? What did you learn? Yeah, so um, the poll was fascinating. And before I go into the findings of the poll, I want to make it really clear that Compassion and Choice's position is the individual should be able to document their positions in advance. So I don't have a right or wrong around this. But was, what was fascinating to see in the poll is that 73% of people um, said that if they were in a state of advanced dementia, they would want to receive, uh, they would want to stop receiving treatments that prolong their life if they were, um, if they were in that state. So 73%, three quarters of people would not want to live in a state of advanced dementia and continue receiving treatments that prolong their life. However, the default mode within medicine is to continue those treatments. So there really is a disconnect between what people want and what is likely to happen. Can I ask you real briefly, and I don't want to put you on the spot, so if you don't know, that's okay, but that 73%, did you, is this your first poll or did you conduct polls over the past? We've, we've conducted it um, several times now. I think the first one was four years ago, maybe. Um, and it's been high straight through. I, it was about the same. It's oh, been okay. down that percentage straight through from the first time. Um, it was a similar question. It wasn't the exact same question, sure. but um, about 73% of people consistently say, I do not want to live in a state of advanced dementia and continue to receive treatments that prolong my life. I, if I was guessing, I would have thought maybe it was lower, but four years ago, maybe not so much, but maybe 15, 20 years ago, I would expect that number to be lower and to see it gradually increasing over time, just with more awareness and education. Well, we, so we haven't done, done it for that long. We just started it partly because the issue of dementia as a 
as a crisis has really, um, right. I don't want to call it a crisis, as a pandemic has really grown in recent years as medical technologies sure. have advanced. Sure. So why the disconnect, though, between what people want if they have this advanced dementia and how modern, modern medicine is treating them? And you kind of alluded to it, you know, first do no harm. We're here to cure and treat. Where is that disconnect in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with what are doctors like? Why does somebody go to medical school and become a doctor? And they go to medical school and they become a doctor to save people and treat people. And my heart always goes out to doctors and and clinicians in general because it's got to be incredibly difficult when your job is to save people and 100 percent of the time you will eventually fail and or fail in the way we've defined success for the medical profession but that's not really what failure is and part of what we need to do is redefine what medicine is about when you're talking about a terminal disease like dementia when you're talking about a terminal disease like dementia you know we shouldn't be defining success as you know how long can you keep this person alive we should be defining success as, you know, are you achieving the goals and the priorities and the values and preferences that this person would want? Are you meeting their needs? Um, but to be able to meet their needs, you that person has to have documented their needs. And when you look at our healthcare system, there's not even a, mecha- a formal mechanism right now where um, people can capture within medicine what those preferences are. You know, the best that we have for documenting preferences in advance is an advanced directive Um, and, you know, the pulse forms. And they're not really getting into the nuance around what happens to somebody with a terminal disease like dementia that can go on for five, six, seven years. You know, those are really um, talking about people that are, are much you know, farther towards the end of the life. And it's about, do they get aggressive, aggressive treatments at a hospital like CPR or a feeding tube? They're not really addressing, you know, do you forego treatments for another disease? Um, those aren't a part of, you know, what what takes place in a typical advanced directive. So I think we have a mismatch between the goal of the profession and the way doctors are trained, and clinicians, not just doctors, but clinicians are trained. Um, and then you also have, um, a lack of a, a fear on behalf of many people to talk about the end. You know, it's easier to say, oh, I don't want to talk about that. Um, and then we don't really have this formal mechanism in place that's going to encourage people and inspire people to want to plan for the end. And when you put those three things together, you get our default mode of continuing to treat people um, often with um in ways that would be inconsistent with what they would want. Um, and their, their loved ones aren't even thinking about it. Nobody, or rarely is someone going to that patient. It happened with my grandmother. We treated her pneumonia. This was before I worked in this field. No one said to us, this could be a way, you know, your, your, your grandmother's been in a state of advanced dementia for four years now, and this could be a graceful exit for her. Would you like us not to treat her, her pneumonia and just keep her comfortable? It was just an automatic. It was just, you know, like we were on the roller coaster of healthcare. Yeah. And and I think too, you know, and I don't know if you guys would see the similarities. For me, it's almost like the 30, 40 years ago where, you know, cancer was kind of treated in the same way where, you know, sometimes they wouldn't even get a diagnosis because the doctor gives that diagnosis. He's already failed because he knows he can't treat it. And, you know, thank goodness, you know, we've had advancements and treatments and different things and therapies for people with certain types of cancers. Now it feels like dementia has traded places with cancer where, you know, you don't even want to speak the word. You know, a friend of ours has a show called The D Word. You know, he's like, it's just the new C word. You know, um, it's just unfortunate. Uh, Jessica, and I should say uh, just one last thing. I should say at the same time, there are many things, supports we can provide to people with dementia um, in the form of palliative care earlier absolutely. in their dementia diagnosis that are going to make them far more comfortable. And those are often overlooked as well. So, you know, what we really want is for people to have be able to use the full benefits of medicine and to be able to have the kind of care that they want. So it's not just about the person who wants to forego treatment. It's also about the person who wants to get, you know, that their pain and their treatments and their symptoms addressed. And both of those things are equally important. So I just wanted to be sure. Excellent there was- point. Excellent point. And, you know, that's kind of another thing I wish more people were aware of is palliative care and make it more widespread and available to families. 
uh, because often they think it's like traditional treatments, medicine, healthcare, or hospice. And, you know, you have that nice segue with palliative that can help with a lot of those things and they can still get the treatments that they wish to have. Uh, Jessica, I want to go to you again. Um, So Compassionate Choices has a tool to help address these issues, this problem, if you will. Can you tell us more about that and what it is and kind of go through it with us? Yeah, I'm happy to. So along with this goal of really inspiring conversation, just normalizing, talking about it, because like you said, you were exactly right. Too many people um, have difficulties getting a diagnosis, don't want to talk about what's going on. We are a society that does not embrace somebody that could be living with cognitive impairments. So Compassionate Choices has developed what we call the Dementia Values and Priorities Tool. And it's designed to help you not only think about what you want, but communicate your wishes regarding future care if you should be living with dementia. So it's an online tool. Um, It is confidential. It's no cost. It's free. And it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to go through um, to complete it. And after you go through the tool, the person will receive a, a document that serves as an addendum to accompany their existing advanced directive that will speak specifically to the unique needs of somebody living with dementia. Like Kim was saying, regular advanced uh, advanced directives don't speak to the specifics of what you could be dealing with in dementia. And so this is what this tool does. It, it addresses that. Um, And then this document is also something that you would have to be able to share with your loved ones, with your medical providers, your hospice team, anyone else that's a part of the care team to be able to help communicate their wishes. Would you, for people who may not understand the document, what would you compare it to? Like an advanced directive, like a five wishes? Yeah, it's so it's actually a dementia directive um, and there are a handful out there. The thing that's unique about the Compassion and Choices tool is that ours really prompts you to think about what's important to you, right? Your values, your wishes, um, your quality of life. What does quality of life mean to you? So it's a dementia directive. So it serves as an addendum. So it's an add on to your existing advanced directive form. Um, that goes into a little bit more detail and specifics. Wonderful. Now, I understand you guys uh, had a video on the site and there's several links in there. Kind of explain how that works. Yeah, so the tool works by guiding you through some really important information. First off, we start by talking about advanced directives because, you know, one of the things we know is that people recognize advanced directives are important, but people don't always get around to doing them. So, you know, about one in three people actually have an advanced directive and even less have shared it with their medical team. So this is really important information. So our tool wanted to make sure that we're helping to educate people about how important that is. And even if you have one, make sure you update it. Make sure it's not locked away in a drawer where nobody knows about it or can't find it. So we start with that. And then from there, it'll walk you through a series of questions, different scenarios where you can indicate the kind of care that you would want. And we embedded a series of videos throughout the tool. Um, so our, you know, our goal is to not only help people think about these things, but better understand them as well. So these short videos explain key concepts. They're, ex- they're explained by physicians and nurses to help people understand these terms that they might hear in conversations um, at the hospital with their doctor, whatever it might be, so that they understand what those things mean and then can make decisions coming from an informed place. And I think you guys provided a video called Comfort Care, so let's show that right now. Comfort Care. This is medical care that is directly intended to improve patient's comfort, pain, and relieve symptoms at the end of life. In many cases, uh, stopping aggressive interventional treatment, and we're moving towards just making sure the patient is comfortable. Comfort care can be offered alongside curative care through palliative medicine, or it could be offered at the end of life through a special team of a hospice care provider. 
So Jessica, what did we just watch? Yeah, so this was a quick video um, where we talked about this term comfort care. Uh, comfort care is a term that is often used, um, but it's not always explained. So this video is a great example of the videos that you'll find throughout the tool um, explaining really important concepts so that people, when they're making decisions, know what they are deciding on. So Jessica, you know, you're talking about this, you know, assessment tool, this document, um, and I think we have a couple of sample questions. Why don't you walk our viewers and listeners, and we'll put them up on the screen here for them to see. Go through these two questions with us. Yeah, so here's an example of the first question that we have is, if I am unable to remain at home and live in a nursing facility, then I want. And you'll notice all of our questions are framed in this, if this is what's happening, then this is what I want. And so you have three options to choose from to help communicate what it is that you might wish in that particular scenario. So if you were at this point, would you want to receive aggressive treatments? Um, and earlier in the tool, we actually define these, uh, what the each of these three choices mean. So there's examples, there's more videos that explain some of the concepts there. So the three choices then are, you know, receiving aggressive treatment, treat me, right? Keep me comfortable, but not aggressively, not to the point where it's prolonging my life. And then the third being keep me comfortable, uh, which is another term for comfort care or allowing a natural death. Um, so those are the three options. Wonderful. Another, another sample question uh, that you'll see here is if I no longer recognize my loved ones, then I want. This is a very common thing in dementia, a very common symptom that we see, uh, regardless of what type of dementia you, somebody might be living with, whether it's Alzheimer's, Lewy body, frontotemporal, the brain has difficulty recognizing the faces and understanding that this is somebody that they know. They may not be able to recall names or, or understand that they know this person. So this is a common symptom. And so if somebody was living with this change in their brain, then what would they want? Wonderful. Um, Kim, let's go back to you. Let's talk about once they're finished with this, you know, incredible, remarkable, much needed tool, what happens next? So the tool um, takes all of their answers to their questions and it puts together, it spits it out into what we're calling the dementia directive, um, which is an add on to your advanced directive. We do encourage people um, to get it notarized um, uh, and definitely follow whatever the rules are in your state um, to make an advanced directive valid. Um, but if you get it notarized and you can do that, that will um, kind of give you that added protection. Um, and then you really want to be sure that all of the people that are going to be there with you at the end of your life have a copy of this. So Obviously, you've identified a healthcare proxy as a part of your advanced directive. That should be a person that you feel confident is going to be able to represent your values. It's really important you sit down with that person, you go through this, you make sure that they're comfortable filling it out um, and, and, and carrying out these wishes on your behalf. You want to talk to your doctor about it. You want to give copies to your doctors. Um, but you also want to give copies to anybody that might be with you in the room. Because one of the biggest challenges at the end of life are what we refer to in the field as the swoopers. And the swoopers are typically somebody that loves you, but they have not been involved in your care for a really long time. And at the very last minute, they realize that you're at the end and they come in and they swoop in. They have no idea what your values or priorities are. And they feel really strongly that they're going to show everybody that they love you by making sure that you get the most available care possible, which in sometimes is perfectly appropriate, but in other times it's, it may be for 73% of people inconsistent with what this person wants. That um, so true so that's, you know, that's um, part of what you want to do is operationalize your advanced directive so that you increase the odds that it will be followed. And that means talking about it. Yeah. And that, it, that is, again, very true. That happens very often, right? Um, sticking with you, Kim, where can folks go to learn more about this tool and the other work that you guys are doing at Compassion and Choices? Yeah, so the website is a great place to start. It's um, full of information. It's www.compassionandchoices.org. Um, and it's chock full of information. And I would just want to say in closing that 
Um, I know these conversations can sometimes be difficult to have. Um, if you don't want to do it for yourself, because my parents started out when I tried to get them to have these conversations with me saying, I'll be comfortable with whatever it is that you do. So I don't need to talk to you about it. I trust you. And what I find, what I finally was able to get through to them was do this because you love me, because it is a gift for me. And because if we don't have these conversations, it is going to be so difficult for me to make those decisions for you. So if you don't want to do this for yourself, um, think about it as a gift that you can give to your loved ones. It's the guilt of clarity and closure and completeness. And what you'll find going through the process is it doesn't just make you clearer about what your priorities and values are at the end of life, but it also makes you closer to your loved ones because all of a sudden you're having conversations that um, that are so important and it's going to raise other things. You're going to re realize closure around some issue that happened earlier in your life. And so it, it brings families together in such a meaningful and important way um, that I just encourage everybody to take on this opportunity um, and embrace the inevitability of death. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And we'll have the website as well up on the screen and in all the show notes. Um, I want to close first by thanking both of you remarkable ladies for your time today and for the much needed tremendous work that you are advocating and doing day to day. And it's, I just can't commend that enough. I want to close though, by asking each of you one question and you can answer separately and hopefully it's not the same answer, but if it is, it's okay. Why do you do what you do? I'll start with uh, Jessica. I do what I do because you can't, we cannot escape death, but I can help people escape the fear that can come with it. It doesn't have to be a scary, fearful, painful experience. Death is a natural part of life. It's something that we all at some point will, um, experience, right? The loss of another person. And if I, in my work, can help make that an easier process by providing people with information, help pointing them in the right direction, connecting them to resources, that's what I'm here for. That's wonderfully said. Kim? Um, so I first started to do the work that I do because I had an experience with two grandmothers that was really devastating at the end of life, one who had dementia and one that had an advanced directive that wasn't honored. Um, and then I had an experience with my grandfather who was in hospice care and had um, the most beautiful end of life. And the juxtaposition between those two deaths made me recognize that, or those three deaths, I should say, made me recognize that how one dies matters, not just for the dying person, but for those that are left behind. The completeness and closure that I got in my grandfather's experience was so powerful for me that it made me recognize that this is worthy of my time and efforts and, and is my calling. Interestingly, since I have come to join this work, um, and do this work on a day-to-day -day basis, what I have seen is that the way somebody lives when they're fully present to the fact that life is finite, like our courageous storytellers who are terminally ill, they live with such power and conviction um, and intentionality that it's truly inspiring. And it actually mirrors all the evidence and data that um, researchers like Dr. Lori Santos from Yale talk about on the science of well-being, that it's made me realize and try to mirror that, you know, the acceptance and embrace of the inevitability of end will allow me to live my life to the fullest. And I want to bring that lesson a lesson to as many people as possible because we all only have one life. Right. Um, and um, if we can step into it and be courageous and powerful and intentional, um, we can create an amazing world around us with um, connectivity and trust and authenticity and well-being. Wonderful. Well, Thank you both. I appreciate your time today. And, you know, anytime we can be of help or service to you guys and Compassion and Choices, we're, we're here for you and look forward to continuing to see the tremendous work you're both doing. Thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you for joining us today here at All Home Care Matters. All Home Care Matters is here to help families as they navigate these long-term care issues. We invite you to visit us at allhomecarematters.com 
where there's a private, secure, fillable form where you can give us feedback, show ideas, or if you have questions. Every form is read and responded to. And remember, you can listen to the show on any of your favorite podcast streaming platforms or watch the show on our official YouTube channel. Just make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. We'd also like to say thank you again to Kim Callanan and Jessica Impanio for joining us today. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again here at All Home Care Matters. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to you joining us again on another episode of All Home Care Matters. To learn more about the show and to connect with us, visit us at allhomecarematters.com.